But I got a really cool letter. Somebody say God is faithful. And I want you to realize that when you're faithful to God, thank you guys, you guys be seated. I want you guys to realize that, man, when you stand for truth, when you stand for righteousness, when you stand for the word of God, and when you operate in the kingdom principles, you never know the impact that you're going to have. So I got an email yesterday. You can turn me down just a smidgen. I got an email yesterday from a lady who said, uh, is this still, Steve Foss, is this still your email address? Because I, I, you haven't heard from us for at least 10 years. And uh, I'd only actually ever met this couple one time. And she's, I said, yes, that's me. And, boy, I'd love to hear more. She said, it's been an amazing adventure the last 10 years. I'd like to tell you some about it. So I said, yeah, it's me. Please let me know. So she wrote me this letter last night. And I tell you, I got all choked up. This is powerful. She said, back in 2001, so it's actually 12 years ago, we were finishing paying off back business debt that had been around our neck for years. He said, you pre-, she said, you preached at Richmond Baptist Church in Nelson, New Zealand. That's in the North Island of New Zealand, Richmond Baptist Church. And I'll, I'll never forget that trip at Richmond Baptist Church because it was crazy. That whole region was really the Brethren denomination was the main denomination down there, and the Brethren are dispensationalists. So they don't believe that there's any more apostles. They don't believe there's any more prophets. You know, they, they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and I, and I show up. <laughs> and it's a town of only a few thousand people, so like most of the town shows up to come and check out. And, and I mean, they came to check it out. And they loved my preaching, but as soon as the power of God fell, they just flipped out. And so, so I was, I was going, <laughs> so anyways, I was in there as preaching and she said, you preached at Richmond Baptist Church in Nelson, New Zealand. And I was upset at what I felt was a prosperity doctrine. Now I want to stop there for a second. Why would anybody get mad at being preached that God wants to take care of you? Boy, it's quiet now. I mean, do you want me to preach a poverty doctrine? Let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Do you want to experience a poverty lifestyle? No. All right. <laughs> Come on. The Bible says, I pray that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Well, well, well I don't want to be naming ground. We're not talking excessive lusting after the flesh, but we're talking abundance in every area of your life. Amen? So he said, so I, I you know, I, I, I thought you were, I felt you were preaching a prosperity doctrine message. She said, I was upset at what I felt was a prosperity doctrine, and I told you so. She did. She came up in my face. I mean, she was mad because she, 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 they had been paying on this debt for years. I remember this experience. She had been, they had been paying on this debt, and they were struggling all the way, and she got mad, and she said, I just don't think what you're preaching is right. We've been faithful. We've been tithing. We've been this. We've been that. And she was, like, mad at me. Now, I could have got a preacher attitude. Right, But she said, let me read all this. Okay. We had been faithful with our tithing and the lean years of debt repayment. Anyway, you gave us $100 cash. Nice. There again, she get mad at me, so I pulled out $100. I said, I'm going to sow into your life. And I said, I want you to believe God for a hundredfold. She said, you gave us $100 cash and told us to pray for a hundredfold increase. We gave the $100 away and prayed faithfully for one month. You also told Paul, her husband, to get your family ready to go overseas. I shook my head in disbelief at that one. I was 40 years old and did not have a passport and had never been anywhere. Well, that was the start of many adventures. <laughs> Within a year, we were in Papua New Guinea teaching together at a missionary school. And God provided more than $10,000 for airfares and setup costs. That was our hundredfold increase. <laughs> I should have read this before I took the offering. <laughs> on, on top of that, we, had, we, we have supported uh, or we had support for our missionary position. The lean financial years had been preparation for what God was going to do. We have been channels of lots of money. 
Our three teenage daughters came with us to Papua New Guinea and were motivated in missions. Now, you have to understand, if you don't know about Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea is one of the most demon-possessed backwoods. They still got cannibals there. They're still killing missionaries in Papua New Guinea. This is a one of the most dangerous places on the planet right now, ungodly. I mean, the demonic forces that go on there are things that most of us never even dream of. We're talking about, I don't even know if I should share this with you, but we're talking about human beings morphing themselves demonically into animals. And I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. We've had missionary friends down there and the level of demonic manifestation is like nothing they have ever seen. So they go, God sends her, this little lady, 40 years old, never been outside of this little tiny town in the north part of the South Island of New Zealand. And a prophet comes along, gives her a word, you're going overseas. And they end up in one of the most demon-possessed places in the world. And then their three teenage daughters go with them. I mean, listen, this is a violent, violent place, dangerous. And the three teenage daughters were, daughters were so motivated in missions also and have since all been involved in other projects outside of us. And a whole village of national Papua New Guinea people came to Christ and we built a church. <laughs> and we put a water tank system in two other villages. Since then, we've been many more adventures. Currently, we live in Thailand. They've been in four, they've been missionaries now for 10 years or 12 years in four different countries. We live in Thailand. We believe God has called us to establish a Christian school in the city of Apayeta, Thailand. This is a city with over 30,000 prostitutes. Missionaries are desperately needed to work here. Missionaries and Christian families here are in, in Payeta have very few schooling options. They have a Thai school, which is Buddhist teaching, and a very expensive international school, and that's it. We firmly believe God is asking us to create an affordable alternative. We are currently raising support for this project, and that is why I was reflecting back on how this all started. I remembered God's faithfulness in the past. She said, after you visited Richmond Baptist Church in Nelson, New Zealand, the pastor there, David Coster, got a lot of flack for the teaching you had brought. Yes, he did. For a whole year, they just went after him because they brought in the apostle and prophet of God. But he stood strong. And I'll never forget the last night. That was a meeting of meetings. God took, was stretching my faith and bringing me into a new dimension. And he sat there and he told me, he said, I want you to preach this message. Because we were, I mean, I'm telling you, people were showing up just to get mad at me. People were showing up just to criticize. They were showing up just to pick a fight over the supernatural. And God said, and they were accusing me, he's pushing people over. And he's just, you know, he got bad breath and stuff. You know, whatever. <laughs> you know, all the different things. They were just throwing it. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, he said, I want you to preach. And then I want, I want you to stand still and do nothing and watch what I'm going to do place was packed. I mean, it was hundreds and hundreds of five, six, seven hundred people there. I mean, no seating anywhere. Place was absolutely packed out. The word around the town had been all around what was going on. I preached my heart out, preached the message, and then I just walked up and I just stood there. And I turned to the pastor and said, would you come and just stand next to me? And he kind of stood there. And then I turned to him and I began to prophesy. And I began to speak to him about the call of God and the nations and the apostolic call upon his life. And as I spoke to him, the power of God hit him and he just went, bam, under the power of the Spirit. Never had happened to him before, by the way. This precious Baptist pastor. Bam, out under the power for an hour. Could, didn't move for an hour. And I mean, everybody's like in shock. And I just stood there. I just stood there. Didn't say a word. Waited. Didn't even pray in tongues. You know how hard that is for me. I mean, I just stood there the whole time, just waiting. All of a sudden, about five minutes into it, all of a sudden, people started crying. People started shaking. People started groaning and moaning. Then people started spontaneously getting out of their seats. Sinners started spontaneously getting out of their seat and running, running forward to give their life to Jesus Christ. I wasn't even given an altar call. It was somewhere between like 40 and 60 
people, first time ever to give their life to make a decision for Christ. They ran forward. Then the power of God hit the place. Hundreds of people were slain in the spirit, laid out all over the place. And I mean, the power of God, people were just falling. I'm just standing. <laughs> Woo, someone say we serve an awesome God. Come on, let's give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone say the Lord is good. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I need my chalkboard up here. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. Is it up here? Yeah, book of Ephesians chapter 6. We're picking up on our spiritual warfare school of ministry. How many of you been getting a lot out of this? Hallelujah. On our spiritual warfare school of ministry. God has been doing amazing, amazing things in our midst. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 and 14. Let's put them up and read them together out loud. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Everybody say the breastplate of righteousness. Now, two weeks ago, we begun to delve very powerfully into this amazing word and principle called righteousness. We begin to go down how righteousness is an offensive weapon against the enemy. Talked about it with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God was saying that he was willing to spare the entire cities of 200,000 people for just 10 righteous people. Because the powerful life of the righteous when they're living righteously has the ability to change things in the spiritual atmosphere. That when we actually, and, and I'm going to say, everybody say live righteously. We talked about that there's two forms of righteousness. This is where some of the confusion comes in. There is imputed righteousness. That has been given to us at the cross. That is that we stand before God under the blood of Jesus, covered by the blood of Jesus. We stand before him clothed with the robes of righteousness. We stand holy and righteous and clean before God right now. Come on, amen. We stand before God clean. When we're repentant, when we've come before him, made him the Lord of our life, we stand before him clean. That's imputed righteousness. But there is another form of righteousness, and that is imparted righteousness. Imparted righteousness is not positional. Imparted righteousness is the power to actually live this thing. It is the power to actually live it out. That you no longer, you no longer, oh, yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Because I got to smack, can I smack the devil here? See, I want you to really understand this because we got to get it to, to a breakthrough here. And I'm going in a different direction, so let me just hit this quickly. If you would ask people today, what was the problem with the old covenant? Because we are under a new covenant. What was the problem with the old covenant? They would tell you the problem of the old covenant was the law. And because of the law, then we were bound by guilt. We were bound by condemnation and we were bound by judgment. But I want to submit to you that the law was never the problem. The law also, by the way, wasn't the solution, just to let you know. But the law wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't the law. The problem was sin. Sin has always been the problem. Let, let me give you an example. We've got a lot of people in jail today. They're in jail over sexual crimes, you know, rape and, and, and molestation and all those kind of things. Now, these are deep manifestation, manifested sins in their lives. But they're in jail because these things are a violation of the law. So people say the problem is we got a lot of people in jail and we want to get them free. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the law and release all of them from prison. Now, are they free from prison? Are they free? Because you can change the law, but that doesn't change the problem. 
You can fulfill the law, and that doesn't change the problem. Because the law wasn't the problem, sin was the problem. See, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He didn't come just, and he did fulfill the law. He didn't come just to fulfill the law. He did release us from the bondage of, of guilt and shame and the judgment. Glory be to God to that. But he came for a much greater purpose. He came to deal with the real root problem, and the real root problem is sin. Come on, Amen. So this is why Jesus came. For this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the... The law was never a work of the devil. Sin is the work of the devil. Are you all with me on that? So the law, as the Bible says in Romans chapter 7, is holy and just and pure and spiritual. The law was not the problem. The, the sin was the problem. If we didn't have a sin nature, we wouldn't have had a problem with the law. See, what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, let's turn this up in the Amplified, Romans chapter 8, verse 3, and I want you to get this for where we're going. It's going to help you. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 from the Amplified, if you can throw that up. Okay, for God has done what the law could not do. Its power, the law's power, and the law had some power, being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, God condemned. Everybody say condemn. That's a powerful word there. God condemns sin. He didn't condemn law. He condemned sin. Keep it up there, please. God condemned sin in the flesh, subdued sin, overcame sin, and deprived sin of its power over all who accept the sacrifice. Now, hear me carefully. The power of sin over your life was not judgment. That was the, re the fruit of sin or the result of sin was judgment. The power of sin was not judgment. The power of sin was sin. The essence of all sin, the root of all sin is self. And the essence of all sin is the rejection of God's rightful authority over our lives. It's rebellion. The, the sin nature, which is Romans chapter 8. Show me. Romans chapter 5. Let me put this down. Romans 5, 12 through Romans 8, 39 is all dealing with sin singular. It's a singular a verb there, not a plural. It's a, a singular noun. It's not plural. And it's dealing with the, the Adamic sin nature, Adam's sin nature. The nature that entered into mankind, that thing that we were born with, that that's why all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, because you are born with the nature of sin. You don't have to teach a child to say no. They're going to learn no. Come on. You don't have to teach a child rebellion. You got to teach them how to obey. Come on. Amen. Why? Because you, everybody was born with a sin nature. The Bible says that God sent his son. The law had no power to break the sin nature. It only had the power to expose the wickedness of the sin nature. But Jesus came and sent in, in his glory, Jesus came not only to release us from the judgment. Thank you, God, for that. Come on, amen. But he also came to deliver us from the Adamic sin nature I hope you're going to get a hold of this because many of us, the Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of. We got a lot of preachers out there been preaching for years. Well, just as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to sin once in a while, brother Steve. Well, what you doing in the flesh? Come on, those, the Bible says those who are led by the Spirit will not fulfill the works of the flesh. Come on, Amen. See, as long as you believe that sin, the old man, has a control on you, then you're going to yield your members to him. And whoever you yield your members to, that's who controls you. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, yield your members to God. Oh, my Lord, I got so many scriptures popping in me right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Someone said the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. Mm. We have been delivered. God has not just imputed righteousness to us so that we can come boldly before the throne of grace with confidence, but he has also imparted into us his righteousness, 
his character, his nature. So we can then walk using his character, his nature to overcome the temptations of this world. Oh, my Lord Jesus. Everybody say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So why don't you believe you can walk free? Woo. Well, Brother Steve, I'm just struggling. As long as you keep confessing that, you will be. As long as you keep believing that lie. No, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that, that does, and I'm not just, see, I'm not just delivered from the jail cell of the judgment of sin. I'm delivered from the thing that got me in the prison in the first place. Huh? Come on. The Bible says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Every say free indeed. Free. Say it again. Say free indeed. Free. I, I want you to go. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't think this is working. I don't think I'm getting my new notes. Oh, Lord. Let's go to Romans chapter. Let's go to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. I'm going to have to. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. <laughs> I want to. Show, I got something I'm going to show you tonight that's going to fry your socks off. It's really good. You all ready for something to fry your socks off? All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 says this. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Everybody say pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. Now, he's not talking about pursuing something you positionally are. You don't have to pursue what you're positionally before God. Everybody say, I'm positionally righteous. Okay? So you are positionally righteous. So you don't have to pursue, pursue something you are already positionally. You have to pursue something that you haven't yet acquired to. It's not talking about being, did you find it? Glory to God. <laughs> it's not talking about pursue your positional righteousness. It's talking about pursuing actually being able to live a righteous life. Hmm. No, that wasn't it. That's what I had. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 24. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24. Now, I want you to put this deep inside of your spirit because this is very important. If you would listen to some preachers today, you would believe because all the talk about, how I many do we hear a lot of talk about don't be religious, right? We're not under the law, right? All that talk. You would think the great end time battle, the great strategy of the devil in the end times, from what you're hearing preached today, you would think the great end time battle and, stra and, uh, and strategy of the enemy is to bind people up in legalism. Right. Come on, amen? And Jesus has released, the God, Holy Spirit has released his brand new revelation on, uh, uh, on, on our freedom. So we don't have to be bound by re legalism or by the law or, or by a religious spirit any longer because that's the end time strategy of the enemy. But I'm going to show, show you from scriptures that's not the end time. In fact, Jesus never warned us about that in the end times. Let's go to Matthew 24. Now, Matthew 24, you have to understand, every scholar agrees. Matthew 24 is speaking of the end times, the days immediately leading up to and including the great tribulation. And these verses I'm about to read to you are the days immediately leading up right before the great tribulation. Matthew chapter 24. Whew, glory to God. Beginning with verse 11. Here we go. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love, the agape of many will grow cold. That word there is agape. Only born again believers have agape because agape, the Bible says the agape of God was shed abroad on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so in the church, Many false prophets will rise up and they will deceive many. And what will they deceive them? They'll deceive them into a lawless lifestyle. Into a lifestyle that is not pursuing living righteous. And because of lawlessness, the agape of many will grow cold. 
the great end time war and strategy of the enemy is not the bondage of legalism. And legalism is bondage. And we have to walk free from that. You can't earn favor before God. Come on, somebody, amen. You can't be good enough to earn his love, and you can't be good enough to earn his favor. He gave you his love. Oh, glory to God. Come on. And he gave you his favor. He said, come on in. Come on in. (laughs) Glory to God. Huh? I'm going to show you something in a a verse here in a moment that will show you where Jesus even says that, but puts these things in perspective. But it's not, that's not the great end time of strategy of the enemy. The great time and strategy of the enemy is to send false prophets who will declare a false message, who will cause the people of God to go astray and to wander into lawlessness, to shed off all restraints and live in an unholy, ungodly way. How many want to know the strategies of the enemy? Come on, amen. Somebody say the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says this. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Holiness, can I put this word up here? Because it's really not dirty. Holiness is not a dirty word. Holiness is not a legalistic word. Holiness is not a religious word. Holiness is not something to be avoided. Huh? My goodness, you can hardly preach this in churches anymore. They get all freaked out on you. Huh? Even holiness churches don't preach holiness anymore. Now, I'm not talking about, please, let me clarify for just a moment because I want to get into something that's really powerful here. Let me clarify something. And I think you guys know this. You can see the way we are. I'm not talking about buns of steel. I'm not talking about, you know, you can't wear this, you know, all these little crazy, crazy little things, you know. You know, if you, you you know, you go see a ball game, you're going to hell. Cut your hair, you're going to hell. Huh? Right? 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 Wear makeup, you're going to hell. Thank God for makeup. My old, my favorite line is this, if the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> we preachers preached against makeup until we went on television and had to wear it. <laughs> then we had a revelation from God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we're not talking about just imputed, but imparted. Who hunger and thirst to actually live like Jesus. Why do we find it so hard that we can actually live like Jesus? Oh, my. Come on. <laughs> That's what the Bible says, Seek ye first in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his, and his righteousness and all these things shall be out unto you. Very interesting. He said, seek first the kingdom. So seek first the, get under the authority of God. Very interesting that he puts that word there, kingdom. Because remember what we said the essence of sin was? The essence of sin is the rejection of God's legal right of authority over our lives. So he's saying, seek ye first to get back under God's authority and seek his character, his nature, his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I want to make a point to you that, uh, well, maybe I should just start reading those verses. Because I want to make sure you don't get mad at me before I tell you what Jesus said so you can get mad at Jesus. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Someone say there's freedom here. There's great freedom here. John chapter 14. And we're going to begin with verse 19. John chapter 14. And we're going to begin with verse 19. 
Thank you, Jesus. I think my notes just got delivered to me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's come forth. It's, 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 it's having an issue. I have to bring something else up. Oh, my internet's gone. That's why it's not coming up. Can you just run this up quickly? And I need that one to come up right there. That one right there. All right. John 14, beginning with verse 19. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. So let's be very clear. He's talking now about events that are going to take place after the resurrection. All right? So let's put this all in that understanding. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. Everybody say manifest. Manifest. This is very important. We know that the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. We know that the presence of God is everywhere. everywhere. But the manifestation of God is not. Manifestation. Say that word, manifestation. Manifestation is an outward, visible expression of something. Did I spell it wrong? I always do. Something from the invisible world. If I'm angry right now, you don't know it. But if I'm angry... I have manifested. It's tangible. It's visible. You can see it. You can feel it. You can experience it. Okay? God's presence is always around. But how many know sometimes we come into the upper room church and there's a manifestation of the presence of God? Huh? You feel it. You're like... Jesus is here. Hey. Woo. Huh? Or like last Sunday, it was so strong, I'm end up crawling on the altar as the pastor in the middle of the service, bawling my eyes out for 20 minutes. Why? There was a manifestation. Huh? We see miracles break out, signs and wonders. Everybody say manifestation. God wants to manifest himself to us. Who say that after me? Say God. Wants to manifest himself to me. So now let's look at this. He said, verse 21, watch this. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me. Number one point, the the proof that you actually love God is you actually do what he wants you to do. And if you're not doing what he wants you to do, then you're not walking in love. You can say you love. You can feel feelings of whatever you think is love. But if you love God, you'll do his commandments. Uh, come on. We, that's, where, that's where the great deception is. Well, well, I love the Lord. But they're out there drinking, smoking, cussing, lusting, doing all kinds of things. Oh, I'm forgiven, Brother Steve. I love the Lord, but I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. You are so selfish because all you're worried about is your own, whether you go to hell or not. You and I, you haven't been born again yet. You don't even know Jesus yet because the love of God is selfless. When you truly get the love of God, your eyes are going to get off yourself. Come on, Amen. When 
you truly have the love of God, you're going to put God first, and then you're going to put other people first, and you're going to want to see. You're going to want to be like him. You're going to manifest him. Now, thank God for forgiveness and grace and his mercy, right? If we, when we stumble, as we're learning to live this thing out, because you've got to have some renewing of your mind. Come on, Amen. As you learn to live this thing out, we can keep coming back. We can keep get repenting. We can keep getting forgiven. Given, and we can keep coming boldly before the throne to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. But you are pursuing the holiness of God. You're pursuing actually living like him. See, the Bible says in 1 John, oh, my Lord, chapter 2, verse 15, he says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oop, it is. Huh? But when the love of God, the Bible says the love of God compels us. When the love of God is in you, why? He first loved us, not we first loved him. And we go, we receive his love and the love of God is in us. Then we are going to pursue holiness. You cannot separate the love of God from the holiness of God. It's impossible. Or let me rephrase it this way, what we're talking about. You can't separate the love of God from the righteousness of God. And the Bible says, put on righteousness is a breastplate. It's a mighty offensive weapon against the enemy, and it's a mighty defensive weapon to protect your vital organs. It protects who you are. And the righteousness there is not just the imputed righteousness. It's the imparted righteousness. Put on holy living, and it will protect you. Okay, can I bring this down right where the rubber meets the road? Dude, don't do the thing with her and there's going to be less problems in your life. Come on. Stop getting drunk. It's going to help you. Don't lie. It will go better with you. Come on, amen. Now, watch this. Jesus says, the one who obeys my commands is the one who loves me and I will love him who I will love him and manifest myself to him. <laughs> Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> I like how they clarified that. <laughs> Said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and told us the secret why you my followers get my manifestation and the world doesn't. He's going to answer the question. Let's look at it. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things, he says, he says here's the deal. How, how, why will you manifest yourself to us? Because you're going to keep my word. You're going to hold on to my word. You're going to believe in my word. And you're going to act on my word. You know, there's a lot of people, we see that in every area of life, and I'm not talking about just in the realm of dealing with sin, but how about in every area of our faith walk? When you keep his word, when you hold on to his word, I want to hold on to the promise of God that he was wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. The people who tap into that, who hold on to that word, see the, uh, see the manifestation of God's healing. Hello? Come on, amen. There's a lot of people who don't believe in that word, and they, they, they're, they're sick. They, they live their Christian life. They love God, but they live their Christian life sick all the time because they're not, hold, they're not loving all of his word. They're not holding on to that word. They're not keeping that word, and so they're not seeing the manifestation of God. Come on, amen. 
See, I, I, I know as we focus on God and we keep that word, the revelation of God before us, we'll see the manifestation of God. People ask me, what, what, like this dear lady, I went down there. This was a hard, quote, unquote, area to preach. But, I mean, we had miracles and power breakthrough. I said, Brother Steve, how did you do that in a place where they're so resistant? And these were church people that were resistant, okay? How can you do that? Why? Because I was not trusting in my ability as a person to articulate. I was trusting in the power of the word. <laughs> and I knew if I preached the word and I trusted in the word that these signs shall follow. They go preaching everywhere and these signs shall follow them that believe. I just expect wherever I show up, miracles to happen. And guess what? They happen. Because <laughs> I keep his word and he manifests himself. Come on, amen. I keep that word. I don't just say, well, I casually believe it, but don't act on it. No, I act on that word. See, there's a, there is a power. Hear me. There is a power to acting on the word. Whether it's acting on the word of don't do something or acting on the word of do do something or acting on the word of, of the praying the prayer of faith or acting on the word of laying your hands on the sick or acting on the word of pulling on the gifts of the spirit and coveting them. But in every area. My Lord. Somebody said the devil's a liar. Now, watch this. He's going to share with us. He says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, verse 26, the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to stop here and maybe have a little debate with the word of God for a second. Because I don't know about y'all, but I have found the Holy Spirit a little more than just my helper. I think that is an underrated word right there. Because unless he, like, is controlling, I'm in trouble. I don't need the Holy Spirit to help. I need the Holy Spirit to take over. I'm just going to yield, take over. Because I ain't living this thing right. I ain't living. I ain't living out righteously without the Holy Spirit doing it through me. All right, maybe you're better than I am, but I need the Holy Ghost. All right. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and... Oh, see, some people say, well, I don't... I, I don't need this. Holy Spirit will just teach us. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he's not only going to show you the new stuff, he's going to remind you of everything I've been talking about since I've been here. He's going to bring that into Revelation. Let's jump to chapter 15, verse 1, just a few verses. Same context. Remember, it's only humans, man, that put those, those verses in there. This is good. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Everybody say bear fruit. Now, there's a consistency throughout Scripture. There's a consistency. What is the fruit? We see it in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Beginning with verse 22. The fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit is not crowds in your church. It's not money in your bank account. Come on. Come on. It's not miracles that flow through you. Thank God for all those things. But the fruit is this. But the fruit of the Spirit is, everybody say love. <laughs> love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And the longer I pastor, the longer that word gets. <laughs> Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. <laughs> Woo! Faithfulness. Oh, my. I just want to go on a tangent right now. Faithfulness. Huh? You know what I noticed? Everybody, pe pe people so often, this is such a wonderful church we have here, but in, our, in this region, what people want is they demand total loyalty from their, from their church and from their pastor, but they don't want to give any loyalty back. 
They want lifelong commitment. Pastor, you're going to love me no matter what I do or how long I go, whatever. But we want to have the ability to just up and bolt whenever we feel led by Jesus. Because they're not looking for a pastor. They're looking for a <clears throat> lady of the evening. They're looking for someone to have a one night, a short term relationship with, but no, not somebody to marry. Oh, it's quiet now. It's quiet now. Hello. Because commitment, well, faithfulness. Ever say faithfulness? So I, I believe in God connections and God relationships. I mean, I, I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, circumstances cause those relationships to be farther away than, than a close. But I believe in God connection and God relationship. When I find a God connection and a God relationship, I stay locked into that thing for life. Because what God puts together, it doesn't talk just about marriage. Let no man put asunder. Which means I'm willing to work through the little issues of life. Because God stuck these two things, these two people together. So he obviously had a plan. And he obviously knew how messed up that other person was before he hooked me up with him. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right. He says, every, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Either way, you're getting cut. <laughs> Anybody here ever have some pruning? Show, oh, hey, Lord, keep that. I like that that part. He said, "That's gotta go." Jesus, go. You ever see him come around and really prune a tree? I'm telling you, you got this big beautiful tree. By the time they're done, you're like, you killed it. You ever see a Christian been pruned? I mean, they're walking around going. They're looking all fruity, you know. They're looking all branchy. They're all there. All of a sudden, Jesus comes along, trips up. They're like, <laughs> see what happened to you, pruning. <laughs> he says, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So remember, what is, what is he talking about? He's talking about those that are operating in, in, in love, joy. These are actions, by the way, folks. <laughs> Peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, self-control, self-control, faithfulness, self-control. <laughs> he says, when you're operating in that, I'm going to prune you. What is he going to get rid of? He's not getting rid of the fruit. He's getting rid of the other stuff that's still on you. So all of a sudden, oh, I got love, but I got some attitude sometimes. <laughs> I got joy, but I get down sometimes. Come on, amen. I got long, short suffering. <laughs> long suffering with him, mother-in-law, short, short. <laughs> Y'all know I'm telling the truth. There's some people you have long suffering. Some people you have short suffering with. I have long, I do, I have long suffering with a lot of people in the church. I have very short suffering with McDonald's drive through yeah. I said it was a Big Mac. <laughs> Large fries and fill them up. Please don't give me a big old container half filled. Oh, I know God knows I don't need those fries, but I'm paying for them. I want my. <laughs> I mean, I had to stop going to IHOP. The pancake place. Because <laughs> I kept bringing out my, my pancakes. My three pancakes on this little tiny plate. You can't even put syrup on it. It bleeds all over the place. And then they bring it out and it's already half cold. Because I like lots of butter and the butter doesn't melt. <laughs> and I don't like cold pancakes. I want hot pancakes. I want melted butter. And I want room for the syrup to go all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so I say, please, I beg you, please. Make sure the pancakes are hot on a big plate, lots of butter, and sugar-free syrup. <laughs> I'm on a diet. <laughs> it's true, too. <laughs> and they come out in the little plate, and they're cold. And I say, man, <laughs> the butter is not melting. 
Don't take it back and stick it in the microwave, neither. Don't give me no newt. Flimsy pancakes. Okay, hang on. And just when you're doing that, the Lord will send a member from the congregation. <laughs> Pastor, is everything okay? <laughs> bless you, waitress, bless you. Some pruning is coming along. <laughs> so, <laughs> some of you are laughing like you really can relate. <laughs> Jesus. He says, all right, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, watch this. This is powerful in the context of what we're talking about. You are already clean. Because of the word which I've spoken to you. You are, there is an imputed righteousness. But now I'm going to talk to you about how you live. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now watch this. So here we've got Jesus. All right. Outside of Christ, we can't live the godly, holy life. So, but as long as we have, as long as we have the judgment of sin, we cannot be in Christ. So he came upon, died upon the cross to pay the price for sin, to remove the judgment so that we can come boldly with imputed righteousness. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come boldly and we can abide in him because we, are, we stand before him as righteous. But now from that position of abiding in him, now that we know that we can abide in him. Now, I'm not talking about you, you out there just living like the devil and saying, well, I abide in Jesus. You're deceived. Yeah. Come on, your Bible tells you so. No, but when you're truly abiding in him, you're walking in him, you're humbling yourself, you're submitting to his authority, and you're seeking his righteousness. Then as you abide in him, now you can do something. Now you can start living a holy, righteous life. Come on, you all see that? Watch this, watch this. It's good. Let's keep going. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me. Everybody say abide in me. Now, remember what he said back up a few verses back. <laughs> he says, if you obey my commands, my Father and I will come and make our abide, our abode in you. Are you all hearing me? So, we get saved. We get forgiven. We come in Christ from that place. But we remain in this place by walking this thing out. Now, part of walking, please, I hope you get this. Part of walking this thing out is if you, if you sin, you're, you confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Come on, amen? But that's part of walking this thing out. Watch what he says. I'm not making it up. Jesus said it. It was really intense because the words got read. <laughs> if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, for all the once saved, always saved, oop, I'm sorry. These are branches. They were connected in, and now they're thrown out. Now, someone say, well, Brother Steve, what do you think about once saved, always saved? And I just tell them, I don't really think about it much because I ain't getting anywhere close to the line. <laughs> Come on, amen. I'm just running so hard after him. I ain't, I ain't even worried about, well, you know, <laughs> I, I, ain't, I ain't looking back and saying, oh, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? I'm running so far from the I barely made it line. Come on, amen. 
I don't even want to have a debate with you on what it makes to barely make it. I don't know what it takes. I don't even want to be there. I don't want to get into heaven and be just stripped bare. Like, oh, Lord, Whew, I made it. <laughs> Come on, amen? Because that person going to be a gatekeeper, a door, you know, little mop made there in heaven. I want to be next to the throne worshiping God. I want him saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you abide in me and my words, my words, my commandment, <laughs> my law, I, okay, my word, my word abides in you. You will ask what you will. <laughs> you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Why? Because if you abide in me, and my words are abiding in you, my words, and if my words are abiding in you, it means you're acting on my words. And if you walk, and listen, listen what it says. If you're walking this thing out, then you can ask whatever you want, and it will happen. I don't know why some people believe this, but if you're living in an immoral life, don't expect you to be able to go before God and ask for anything and get it. God's not stupid. Come on, amen. He's not, you're not, you're, would you do, if your child was living in utter rebellion and they said, and they're out there doing drugs and they say, hey, mom, give me a hundred bucks, you're going to give it to them? That's not love. That's ignorance. And neither is God going to do that for you. No, 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 no. I've given you favor. I've given you access to me, but you got to abide in me and my words need to abide in you. You got to follow me. If any man is to come after me, he must deny himself. Why? Because self is the root of all sin. So you got to deny self. You know, if you're denying self, you ain't going to sin. Come on, amen. You ain't going to sin. Not willful conscious sin. Might do a sin of ignorance because you just didn't know any better, but you're not going to do a willful conscious sin. Come on, man. So, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and my words abide in you, which also says something else to me. Oh, this is good. Are you ready for this? The word has the power to get you to live right. See, what the law, the law only had the power to point out what you're doing wrong. But now the word of life under the new covenant with the Holy Spirit anointing that word has the power so you can live right. <laughs> That's why when the Bible says, be ye holy as your Father in heaven is holy, it is not just a, a, a command of rules out there. It's God invoking and speaking something into you. Just like he said, let there be light, and there was light. He's saying, be holy. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, the Bible says his word was with power. Psalm 101 says, or Psalm 100 verse 7 says, he sent his word and he healed them. Someone say his word has power. Say again, say his word has power. So as you submit to his word, as you obey his word, as you come under the authority of his word, it releases the power of God to cause you to actually begin to live this thing out. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, we talked about that word. Talked about revelation. Revelation is the word experienced. That's the dimension that we have to get to. Do you know why so many churches had so many people in bondage? Because they preached even some right principles, but they brought forth no revelation. That's why the Bible says, and the revelation comes by the Holy Spirit. Listen, that's why the Bible says, the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives. See, when that word comes forth, see, let me help you with this. Y'all with me on this? The word comes forth, hey, don't lust after a woman. Now, if all you have out of that word 
is, is, is you've lust after a woman, you committed adultery, and you got lust in your heart, and all you have is, is that as a law out there. That thing can be very condemning because you're like, man, I'm lusting, but here it says don't lust. I feel so bad. I feel so horrible. That's, that's the whole wrong place to be. It's a turning around saying, no, God, give me the revelation of purity and a pure mind. <clears throat> And a holy mind. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove, that you act it out. That you may prove the good and acceptable per and perfect will of God. So I begin to get the revelation that I am holy. Be ye holy, for my Father in heaven is holy. And in that word is the power to overcome. Inside of that word is the power to conquer this lust. So I don't have to yield to that. I don't have to bow to that. I don't have to be tormented to that. I have the authority to take over control of that demon spirit of lust. I can tell it to be bound in the name of Jesus. For he who the Son sets free, his free indeed and no weapon formed against me shall prosper <clears throat> and I start walking in the, uh, the revelation and the experience of that word and start driving back the forces of darkness that are coming at me from the outside as well as taking authority of the things in my heart and taking captive every thought and making obedient for the weapons of my warfare and not carnal but a mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds Come on, Jesus didn't come just to forgive you. Thank God for forgiveness. He came to set you and me free from the bondage of sin. We don't have to be it. The Bible says sin shall no longer be your master, that you should obey its lust. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Somebody say, I don't have to obey sin any longer. Say it again, I don't have to obey sin any longer. Now, again, let me stay with this just for a moment. Hit it again. I hope I'm hitting this good enough for you. If you're riddled with guilt and condemnation, your eyes are still on you. You're still on self. If you've repented, if you've come before God, if you asked him forgive, forgive it's gone. And if you're walking around riddled with guilt and self-condemnation, your eyes are still on you. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That word despise literally means to think against. He had to think against because there on the cross he was filled with all the sin of all mankind. And that shame could have got him to get off the cross. But he wasn't going to let shame get him off the cross. Just like you're not going to let shame get you off the cross. Glory be to God. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on. We think against that shame. My shame was nailed upon the cross. His righteousness is imputed to me. Glory to God. And I know so I can wear the robe of righteousness. And I can walk with boldness and confidence and faith to come before the holy of holies. And then from that position in that relationship with God in abiding in him I'm going to take the word of God and I'm actually going to live this thing out in my life yeah. 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 verse 8 I got to come in for a landing y'all getting this somebody say the breastplate of righteousness so I'm not going to leave a church world bound in simply being released from the prison of the judgment of sin. I want to bring him to the real work of the cross. And that is freedom from the bondage of sin. Yeah. 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 Woo. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. You're not free indeed if you're just not guilty. You're free when you don't need to obey, obey it anymore. You're free when you don't do it anymore. You're free when you overcome it. You're free when you're walking like Jesus. And isn't that what the Bible says? He, we've been predestined by God to be conformed into his image. Time we raise the standard back up. Time we raise the level back up. And it's time we bring people into the revelation and the experience so they can actually live it out. The problem with much of the older church was they preached holiness and did not produce any power. 
So they preached a they preached live holy, but they didn't preach, they didn't bring the revelation of Christ to people because only abiding in the revelation of his word and him could they actually live that life out. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Does it make sense, anybody? Good. I'm having a good time. Benjamin, if you'll come. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. My Father is glorified when you look like Jesus. When you walk in love and joy and peace and patience, gentleness, kindness, meekness, long-suffering, faithfulness, self-control, my Father is glorified when you bear much of this. My Father is glorified. As the Father, so you will be my disciples, he says. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Now abide in my love. I've loved you. Now you need to abide in my love. Watch what he says, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Can't get any clearer than that. If you rebel against my commandments, you're not abiding in my love. And you will not abide in my love. If you keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments. Now, guys, I keep bringing this back because I want you to understand. One of his commandments is, if you sin, repent. Come on, amen. And what does that word repent mean? It, li it literally means to not just change one's mind. That's how it's all. I want to change my mind. No. It literally means to change one's mind and to Stop the action you were doing. As so much to ground that I abhor it. Because the essence of sin is the rejection of God's legal right of authority. I've rejected God's authority. Okay? I've rejected God's authority. That's the essence of sin. So I'm going in a different direction. I'm rebelling against God's authority. I'm not submitting to His word, to Him, to His righteous light, to the way He told me to live. I'm going in the wrong direction. When I repent, I stop rejecting his authority and I resubmit to his authority. I submit. Lord, I give you that part of my life. I submit that part of my life. Lord, I, th I, I repent for looking at that thing and for lusting and for lying and for cheating. I, I, I was in rebellion to you, but I turn back to you. He is faithful and just to not only forgive you. Watch the power of this. To not only forgive you of your sins, but to cleanse you all unrighteousness that's one of his commands the breastplate of righteousness when not only can we walk confidently covered in the robe of righteousness before the throne of grace but we can actually live this thing out are you going to do it perfect tomorrow I would, I would really hope so let me rephrase this. I would love it to be so. My experience at this point was, has been, probably not. <laughs> Although church history has times and experiences where they believed they had reached a point like that. Great Wesleyan revival. They talked about an experience called sanctification. I've heard modern scholars scoff at that and talk it down, but I I'm not so sure. You know why? Because we weren't there. They were experiencing something. They were experiencing something that was so major by God. They were having an encounter so deep with God, a manifestation of God that was so deep that they actually honestly lived lives where they were like, we believe we're done with sin. We're just done with it. That we don't do those things. We don't even act that way. We didn't even think that way. I don't know what that experience was. But boy, Lord, we could use some of that today in America right now. And when we get done with the preachers, we can take care of everybody else. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you obey my commands, he who has my commands and keeps them, it's he who loves me. I will manifest myself to him. 
There's the reality, guys. When we pursue living righteous, physically, in our actions, there is a greater manifestation of God, of Jesus, that will take place. How we lost that in our modern day, I do not know. That is why. That's why we're creating one of the reasons why we're creating the Zadok School of Worship. To raise up a separated, consecrated throne room worshipers. That'll be end time launched into end time frontline ministry. That we're going to get them so separated from the influence of the world. So separated from the spirit of the world. So separated from cultural relevance. So separated unto God. So getting before His presence time and time again. Being washed by the water of the word. and Pursuing that sanctified, consecrated life. I promise you. Make a declaration. You will see phenomenal manifestations of the Holy Spirit will accompany that kind of living. You'll see it. And then from that throne room, sanctified, consecrated place, we're going to launch them out onto the forefront, out into the front lines of what God is doing around the world. And as they begin to lift their voices and lift their instruments and, and, and bring the dance and all the realms of worship and they bring it out there, it is going to destroy the strongholds of the enemy. It's going to shatter them. It's going to be a release of miracles and signs and wonders. I believe like we have never seen before. I know it. I know it. I know it to be true. If the priest in the Old Testament had to walk pure for a year just to stand before the presence of God one day, why have we been so presumptuous? Jesus came and we can come, yes, boldly before Him. But there's a, I don't know how to explain this better. We can come boldly, positionally, but there is a dimension that will walk in God when we live this thing. We actually live it. We actually live it. And it's going to be a mighty weapon against the enemy. I not only am positionally righteous, so devil, you can't condemn me. But I actually live this thing. So you can't bind me up any longer. Jesus, somebody say, I'm going to live this thing. By the power of the Spirit, say, I'm going to live these things. Let me give you one last scripture. I feel His presence. There's a sacredness of God here right now. The sacredness of God here right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, everything we've been talking about, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's cleanse ourselves. Tonight, I'm going to stop watching certain things. Tonight, I'm going to stop having certain conversations. I'm going to stop reading stuff. I'm going to stop spending so much time in gossip on Facebook. I'm going to get rid of some video games tonight. Tonight, I want to start getting rid of those things and cleansing myself. There's a personal responsibility there. He said, cleanse yourself. God cleanses us, but cleanse yourself. You do it. You make some action. Turn off that devil vision once in a while, you know. Come on, turn, turn off that. Uh, don't engage in that conversation. And, and don't be involved in those. And say, I know. And instead, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perfect holiness. I'm going to. I'm going to work on trying to, to actually live this thing out. I'm going to watch what I say, and I'm going to be careful what I put before my eyes. I'm going to be cautious what I listen to. Out of the fear of God. 
not afraid of God. There's a world of difference. But out of the awe-inspiring reverence and fear of, of that He is a holy God, He is holy, and He has called me to be like Him. Oh, God, make me holy. Hallelujah, Lord, make me holy. I choose to walk. I choose to put off the old man. I choose. And I choose to put on the new man, which has been renewed day by day. Glory to God. I'm, I'm not going to, I probably won't be there tomorrow. I'm probably not going to get there the day after that. But every day I'm moving a little farther. Every day I'm moving a little deeper. Every day I'm getting a little better. Every day. Glory to glory to glory to glory. Every day I'm being changed. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be bound by shame, guilt, or condemnation because I know where my Redeemer is. I know where the blood is. I know how to get cleansed when I mess up. But I'm definitely not going to play on the line either. I'm just going to keep running back to Jesus. If I mess up, I'm going to keep running back to Jesus. If I stumble, I'll keep running back to Jesus. I'm going to be as close on the inner circle of Jesus as I can possibly be. Hallelujah. And don't you ever believe the lie. Don't you ever believe the lie. Say, well, I can't do it. No, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. It's the Holy Spirit doing it in you and through you that gives you the power. But you have a responsibility to make the choice. You say, yes, Lord, I will. You step out to do it, and then you watch His power flood in to give you the power to do it. Whew, hallelujah.